Good morning. Good morning, Good morning. So I think we can start. Uh, today we have one topic from uh, Machine Controller Manager. So who's going to present? So I am going to present. Okay. Uh, just one short notice. Uh, we are recording the meetings uh, and the recordings are put on YouTube. I just want to make it, uh, everybody aware of that. Uh, are there any additional topics you want to discuss? Anyone in the call? Uh, do we have any new attendees which uh, weren't attending so far? Yes, it's for the first time for me. Sebastian Dusch. Uh, maybe you can uh, just uh, shortly introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Sebastian Dusch. I'm working for Microsoft. Um, and we recently, uh, we are trying to look into the Garden project mm -hmm. on, on Azure. That's why we, um, or I join the meeting now. Cool. Um, hi, hello. Uh, my name is Pablo. I work for SUSI. I'm also mm -hmm. my first uh, meeting today. Welcome. That's nice to see that uh, more and more people are joining from other companies. Uh, then I would say, uh, Prashant, you can start. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, I hope you guys can see my screen and I'm audible. I can see it, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, uh, so uh, I, we thought we'll just quick give you a quick update on the MCM and any autoscaler changes that we have updates. So uh, uh, we had given an overview of MCM in one of the previous Gardner meetings. So if anyone, if you have a question on the overall structure of MCM and it's working, you can refer to the older meetings. So this is just an update. Uh, so what we have is earlier, uh, we have an enhancement where earlier we had a single norm knob to configure both the creation and health health check timeouts. So these are the timeouts used while the machine is being created and when a health check is done before a machine is termed as failed or unhealthy. So we have earlier this was a single knob to configure this. We have tried to split it into two configurable knobs now. Uh, so yeah, and uh, the other enhancement is that. Uh, so now the MCM, the, the machine controller freezes or unfreezes based on the API server unavailability. So earlier we had this issue where say for example, your API server was down and not reachable. Uh, the machine controller tried to reconcile the cluster state and tries to recreate machines thinking they're unhealthy and things like that. So we have avoided that by having a freeze and unfreeze when the API server is not available. And uh, say so yeah, some more subtle thing is that uh, we have integrated, we have some integration tests to test across uh, AWS, Azure, GCP, and OpenStack. We had that already for earlier. For I'd given an update with AWS. Now we have it for all four. Uh, and uh, some minor fix. We had a minor fix in the error propagation on the OpenStack driver which has been integrated into the MCM. Okay, so uh, just to add a little more on the first topic on the timeouts, right? Because uh, there are also, uh, it's very much relevant for the Azure as well in one way. So uh, what we used to happen in the past is that whenever VM stops responding back to the API server, right? So we, were, we, used, to, we used to have only one knob, which says that if VM does not respond for 10 minutes exactly, then we should basically replace it with the, with the new VM. Right, but that was the same knob that we were we were also using when VM is first time created. So, which basically means that a lot of time uh, you want to have different knob done for the health check, and by when you actually want to create the VM. So, creation of the VM could take more time because that's the standard procedure from the cloud provider. But for the health check, you might want to have a smaller time windows where 
it could be okay that uh, if, if if it does not respond till five minutes and so on, I would still want to replace the VM, right? So now you can configure it in both the different ways. That was the idea. And for the second topic, it's uh, it's, it's something that we learned out of the experience. That is that uh, in machine controller or in any other any other component when the API server specifically becomes not available. So if you see in MCM, we basically look at two different API servers at the moment. One is for the seed, one one is a seeds API server, and one is the shoots API server, right? So what used to happen is that if one of them or any combination of them is not available for any period of time, then it gives a window of confusion to MCM that what could be wrong. So whether whether at that time whether we should really read the machine object and try to infer something, or the good idea is to let the situation heal itself, let both the, both the API server come back properly, and then only we, then only the MCM starts picking the action, right? So from that perspective, we have implemented a freeze, we have enhanced the freeze feature in a way that if any of the API server is not available, then MCM will basically just stop working for those moments, and whenever those are they are coming back, we'll start, we'll start functioning at, as normal with whatever algorithm we have otherwise. Can, it, can this then be seen from some status that it's currently frozen or? So the, the way at the moment is via logs. Okay. Uh, if we, we, we will, if we have, we are anyway going on with the monitoring ahead. So in future, we will have right monitoring stack implemented in a way that if something is frozen or something is really not available, you should probably get some kind of alert via email or Snapchat or whatever. So yes, uh, adding to that, uh, there's also an open issue on exposing better custom metrics. And in the in the metrics endpoint, eventually this free status will be available as well, which the uh, which would be used for the alerting, as Hartik mentioned. Okay. Uh, if yes, and we'll move forward. So that was with the fixes and enhancement. And what we are currently working on is there is support for a new provider packet.net provided colleagues there uh, in the MCM. This is a PR and uh, we've, we are in the process of reviewing it. Uh, and uh, then uh, Hartik has been working on uh, gRPC support for out of trade drivers. So right now, if you want to add a new cloud provider, you have to send in a pull request to the MCM repo itself. So what we are working on is trying to make this out of tree where uh, you can have your own uh, cloud provider implementation on and plug it in with the MCM as a sidecar using the gRPC. And uh, then uh, we have, so there was, uh, so the cluster autoscaler that we have uh, integrated with the MCM had a bug uh, where it was tainting unwanted nodes like while a scale down. So uh, this is being worked upon, is being fixed. Uh, so, and uh, yeah, should be out, should be released soon, a newer version for the cluster auto scaling. And uh, yeah, we are trying to move uh, all the vendoring to the latest KTS version as well, both for MCM and auto scaler. That is one dot twelve. Hi, this is Vasu. Uh, I have just one question, uh, also somewhat um, yeah, connected to the autoscaler. Um, so I've heard requests that when uh, people uh, start tagging the nodes uh, with some mm -hmm. labels or labeling the nodes, mm -hmm. and uh, the autoscaler kicks in and, and um, the, or, or the repair mechanism kicks in in the MCM and the node gets lost and is get getting recreated that the labels are not anymore there right and they were asking for a mechanism not only for labeling you know the worker group label but uh, to have uh, custom labels uh, which are then resilient have uh, have you taken on that issue is uh, so uh, so yeah <laughs> Yes, so there is an open issue on this on the MCM repo, as well as we have, we are trying to discuss with the community also has such an open issue opened on the cluster API. And we are trying to discuss with them and try to come up what would be the right solution on how, like basically there are multiple uh, authoritative, uh, uh, so there are multiple uh, pe people who would try to set these labels and whom to, could be the controller, could be humans themselves and whom, whom do you respect and what way the labels should flow through. Sh should it flow through from the machine deployment? 
how it propagates back and things like that. So these questions are still being discussed in the community and but there is an open issue and there is plan to integrate this feature. But I am not sure how we would be able to uh, regain, say for example, someone tainted a node, uh, right? And mm -hmm. if it's been replaced, and if there's a machine backing it, and if the machine is being replaced by the machine set controller or something, I'm not sure how to uh, get these labels back. Okay. So, yeah. I think, you know, this is more of a very, very, very general topic. So, the reason, so one of the main uh, pillars that we we expect the machines to be ephemeral, right? So, the node, the labels on the node, uh, irrespective of autoscaler also, it, even, even from the MCM perspective, it is always the case that if the machine is not doing well, we will we'll create the new one and that will just remove all of the old labels and it will be a fresh node object, right? So what is being worked upon at the moment, uh, not being worked upon, but in the backlog at the moment is that what we could next offer is that via UI, you can propagate, via, via Gardner UI, you can probably propagate the labels via machine deployment till the machines and the controllers will somehow make sure that if there are XYZ labels available on the machine object, then the corresponding labels will always be available on the nodes which are falling under the same machine deployment or machine set, right? That's mm -hmm. something we can do. But on the other, in parallel, there is something, there's one more thing we can do which we, we are yet to think of is that when user really puts the labels on the node object, should we really put it, migrate it back to the machine object? That is still an open question and we are not sure whether that back so will is, is good idea or not yet. So we'll think okay. of it, but the first approach we'll probably implement. Hmm. Okay. okay. So in, in essence, the, the ask, oh, but I'm, I'm probably discussing something which is already recorded in the, in the issue itself or discussed in the issue. Um, so what, one is that, that there are people who are uh, trying to put in Ceph or um, other types of uh, distributed storage kind of uh, classes and um, or storage uh, layers and then these storage uh, uh, distributed storage layers they require a certain label on onto that so if a node gets lost well the label is gone all of a sudden your um, your whole storage system which you installed becomes um, yeah, yeah, uh, shrinks in size, so to say. So we not, kind of need a resiliency for these kinds of installations. And the same aspect is actually true for the HANA uh, guys who are who, are, who also uh, cannot just rely on the worker pool node labels. Anyhow, I think uh, thank you for for your explanation. Yeah. Yes, I was. And uh, maybe I'll share the link uh, of the issue as well. And maybe okay. we'll try to we'll try to address it as soon as possible. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and yeah, moving forward, uh, some new issues that we have identified recently is uh, we have identified a bug where sometimes a node object is not deleted even after the VM is deleted at the VM. We observe this on AWS. This is something very rare. Uh, so there's no harm essentially like in the sense that you just see a node object which doesn't have a VM object packing it. And uh, we saw, we checked through the controller code in the uh, in the upstream Kubernetes itself, the kube controller manager, the node lifecycle. And we saw it getting stuck in a loop when the VM is deleted and it's not returning a provider ID. Uh, we still are trying to deal with this. Uh, there's an open issue and we are looking into it. And this is other issue as well. Uh, one more issue uh, uh, probably that we missed is when the SSH key pairs to GCP machines are not propagated yet. Uh, so they, I mean, in the other other three providers, you can add SSH key pairs to machines. In GCP also, it was supposed to be there, but I guess it was missing. Something we opened an issue as well for that, and we'll be addressing. Um, Yep. So, uh, to, to add on the first topic, right, about the node object. So one of the approach that we are planning. So essentially the problem is that when you delete the machine, when other autoscaler deletes the machine or MCM decides to delete a machine, basically deletes the VM from the cloud provider, it deletes the necessary machine object. And then we expect that once this procedure is done, 
chip controller manager should come to the picture and do some necessary checks and delete the node object as well right so this is this flow has been working so far very nicely just that it seems that the newer latest version of the kubernetes in very rare cases kube controller manager tries to check that i will delete the node object only if some some trace of the necessary vm is available on the cloud provider which is which is uh, which to me seems should be like a bug it should not be the case when the vm is gone kube controller manager should not go back to and check right so what we are planning to do is from the mcm perspective is that we could uh, also look through the node objects and if we know that there was a vm which was deleted by us and it was uh, intentionally deleted by us then we could also then go and delete that node object as well so uh, otherwise you would see a node object stuck there saying that not ready scheduling disabled and so on so we we can also just so mcm may also in future delete the node object which uh, is um, in parallel to deleting the machine object as well. that's the one of the uh, way we are as of as of now thinking to uh, but on, in parallel of course we'll we'll see if in community this is really a bug and can be sorted out from the kubernetes community so okay yeah uh, so that's about it for uh, the mcm updates i think we can move on to anything next thank you any questions okay if not thank you thank you uh, so there we have a second topic uh, on the agenda about uh, autoscaler config i think that's from becky all right uh, so actually i added the topic and i think becky has uh, recently raised it and to me as well as rafael mentioned i was i was willing to understand the use case more that how can we configure the autoscaler better for you or maybe you can as at least for now do it better for you and one section the extensibility is in which you can overall configure but i would just like to know more about what was the uh, what is the situation uh, okay uh, so we we have a, a qa team can you hear me yes okay so we, we have a qa team in a, in uh, in our company they are they used to work work on uh, on two three clusters and they started complaining about auto scaling being too aggressive uh, actually has an impact on their clusters so we had to disable auto scaler because it downscales clusters in 10 minutes and that's the exact time uh, they they do tests in interval so he start, actually the team kicks in a test and it takes half an hour they stop the test to do some tunings and after 15 minutes kick in the test kick in the test again and it it makes uh, 15 minutes is enough time to downscale the cluster and next time they they kick in the load test it kicks out the auto scaler again and uh, makes the cluster scale as big as to the maximum so i i can actually try to communicate they uh, do uh, during their uh, tests that they we can fix the auto scaler and disable the auto scaler at all we can fix the their cluster to a fixed number and then we, but that's that that's a manual work and it it prevents us to get full uh, power of auto scaler because we we have no control over how aggressive it will be for now i think it's, it's using defaults 10, 10 minutes uh, or down scale so for us, the important piece is how uh, soon it will downscale the cluster. If if we can't leverage auto scaler, Rafael actually suggested using uh, the maintenance, no, not maintenance. Uh, what was the feature called? Uh, you suspend the cluster and hibernation. Uh, but, uh, hibernation. No. Yeah, but for for us, it's it's not so meaningful because. We, if to be able to use that, we have to schedule our uh, our QA team to work on cluster. We don't want to schedule fixed times for the team. Hmm. Okay, but back to the so, question I also posted to the issue. So, uh, why do you for these tests you run? Why do you actually need the auto scaler in this cluster? Oh, it's it's QA team. QA team has. Uh, several clusters they, they don't usually work on a single cluster they switch they, they jump between clusters we, we don't want to uh, schedule 
uh, hey, I, we are jumping on cluster A, okay, let's uh, increase it. And then when they switch to cluster B, which has slightly different configuration for their environment. So each, each jump, uh, when they jump between clusters and each time they jump, they, they need to do tests for uh, five hours and they jump to another one. So they actually not mm. being able to configure downscale period actually forces us to, to have to deal with uh, either uh, changing node count in the, uh, in the cluster or uh, will force us to manually maintain hibernation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you say you have mm, five clusters and you do the tests uh, sometimes on cluster A and they later on cluster B or C and, and you don't want to manually scale down in the, in the first clusters you, you don't need at this point in time anymore. But you want the others to scale up. So you don't want to do that manually. Yes. Okay. That's that's the main main issue. Mm -hmm. Because first okay. first test will, will kick off the autoscaler to hit the cluster to the max. And if we are able to tune the scale down period for, for example, two hours, that would be enough for our case. So I don't need to do anything anywhere else. Mm -hmm. That was our case. Yeah. That's actually an improvement for what we have. I guess independent of the scenario, it's of course a valid uh, ask or request to get these values configurable per shoot. Yes. But yeah, okay, now I have understood. I guess we should discuss that. So I have no immediate answer, uh, but we yeah, can actually, follow up in the next. And uh, I'm not sure what's the recent status of autoscaler. And in the recent Kubernetes upstream version, I'm seeing quite many scale down options. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I, I don't think trying to add all of them makes sense, but we, we can discuss and pick a couple. Uh, I, don't, I don't know, the, yeah, it needs to be discussed in the ticket maybe. Okay. Yeah. So uh, first of all, for this part where, um, uh, so for the upstream autoscaler, right? We have uh, we have uh, made sure that we do not uh, modify even a single line of code of the core logic. So um, basically we, we just take the autoscaler as it is uh, from the upstream and just implement the external interface, which is for the MCM. So which it basically means that all of the features you will see or all of the fixes that you will see on the upstream autoscaler will also be available in the autoscaler fork that we are using. Just that you have to be careful with the release that we are using and it is available there, right? And uh, to add more, I think the use case that you are mentioning is already uh, satisfied from the autoscaler perspective. Yes, the work needs to be done from the gardener side, where how can we make it configurable via UI and make it possible for you if you are using the same uh, upstream binary of the gardener, right? But what I see uh, fitting in your use case perfectly is, I guess, it scaled down unneeded time, right? So what they have done with the scale down is, is following. So the way it is implemented is following, first of all, is that there are continuous periodic loops for scale up and scale down. It basically means that the way you would have configured your scan interval uh, flag, every that every that uh, after that period, scale up and scale down will be triggered. So now it's up to you to decide that when should be the next scale down should happen. So if you don't do anything, it will just take the default numbers. But if you do a configure flag like this, you say that the scale down unneeded time. So here, internally autoscaler basically nominate certain set of machines to be as, as, as unneeded machines, which means their CPU utilization or memory utilization in terms of pod, number of pods there, have gone below the threshold that we have configured before, right? So it would mean that this set of machines are unneeded and then you will have an option to say that this machine should stay unneeded for this much time. So if you make this parameter as two hour in future, then probably it will solve the problem for you. I don't see a need for modifying any other scale down parameters where there is scale down after add, then there is also scale down after delete, then scale down after failure. Those flags are, I guess, for different kinds of use cases. For you, I guess, they should fit in. But this is only possible when you uh, can uh, configure from the front door of the gardener. Or if you are, or if for the performance team there, if you want to, to rebuild Gardner or use the charts and modify it on your own, 
then those there are there are different ways of doing it but i don't i don't know whether there are there are recommended ways of doing it yeah but that's all i, I could is of now so yeah my, my expectation uh, when i was creating this ticket at least uh, make the scale down unneeded time as uh, move it as a parameter to the to to the shoot the shoot spec but uh, okay if it it's only us we can work around hmm. Okay, we, we, maybe we'll we'll check on the ticket mode and see what what, what is doable there, right? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other topics you want to discuss? Seems not to be the case. Uh, then uh, hold on. Why, while we have uh, our guest from Microsoft there, I think uh, maybe big here. Um, you actually had one of the issues on putting Gardner uh, on top of Azure, right? I mean, maybe you can uh, just reiterate what you would like to see on um, with respect to the OIDC and 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 the other options um, on the AKS offering, and uh, and. W you know, if you can just uh, re reiterate um, uh, what you would like to see the Microsoft colleagues to be uh, enhancing. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, I actually, uh, our biggest comment is about not being able to use dashboard on AKS because AKS, on AKS, we cannot know uh, OIDC parameters exactly. And we, we don't know how to configure the dashboards authentication through AKS's uh, AAD integration. So we, we use ROS on, on Azure uh, Active Directory. But uh, actually, we were not able to uh, connect uh, Gardener's dashboard to be authenticated to get the token and pass it to the mm -hmm. AKS cluster from Azure AD. I think maybe there was an issue to, uh, with that, right? That was uh, you. You mentioned it in an issue. Maybe you can bring that up. And uh, uh, so uh, uh, this has been resolved, and the problem only was so Holger is speaking here from dashboard. Uh, so I changed the Helm chart. That now it is allowed to change the URL to the Open ID uh, Connect key endpoint. But anyway, it uh, would have been possible. Uh, to deploy dashboard uh, without using Helm or maybe creating uh, the, the, the manifests with Helm and then deploying it manually. So now it's oh, possible to configure it. Not, actually, our problem is not being able to deploy dashboard. We deploy dashboard, we are able to authenticate to the dashboard, but dashboard gets my token through, through the OIDC, but that token is not valid inside AKS. So I can go into dashboard, I can create projects because project creation is not dependent on my token. It creates the tokens with its own user. Then when, when I try to list the shoots, I can see anything because my token, which is got from uh, Azure AD and passed to the AKS is not valid inside the AKS. Ah, okay, I understand. So uh, we are currently looking at um, Gardner in general. Um, we had uh, a meeting uh, earlier this week to understand what the requirements would be to, to deploy this to AKS. And my understanding was that it's currently not tested and possible, but I found um, a documentation yesterday. Um, so maybe, can you give us more information on what you're trying to set up so we can test it ourselves and then I guess it's easier for us to, to um, reproduce the issue that you have and then work on it. Can yeah, we, and we also then have a consumer uh, in the community who'd, who'd be very interested to see the results, right? Yep. Okay, I, I'm not sure I can summarize the whole issue on top of my hand, head. Uh, no, Maybe. no worries, we can, we can also do that offline or on, on, a, on a distribution list, no problem. Uh, what I found yesterday was in the Gardner repository, in the Gardner organization, I found a deployment and then aks.md 
Uh, oh, I wrote it. <laughs> is that the one that you're, you're trying to get to work? No, no, actually, I wrote that file. <laughs> but in that one, we, I, I had to exclude the dashboard part because we were not able to make it run. Okay, so I sent that piece of information uh, to one of our Kubernetes experts um, to see if that... Uh, actually, that's, that's yeah. also all because in that one, RBAC, when, when I wrote that RBAC was not enabled, uh, RBAC was not available as well as uh, other AD integration. Maybe okay, can, can you, you can you write in the agenda point, you know, a, a link of that updated issue and we can communicate and take it from there? I think yeah. then that's... Perfect. Yeah, I, ca I can update that one uh, for two days AKS as well. That would be great, and then, then we will look into it. Yeah. Right. Okay, do we have any additional topics? Actually, I have one, one other topic. Uh, so okay. recently, our security team is uh, focusing on uh, introducing a strict change management. Uh, so before uh, updating Gardener releases, we want to know what would be the exact impact on shoots in, in that garden. At last our last gardener upgrade triggered to uh, it was to the one thirteen one I guess from one uh, twelve uh, something and it, it triggered uh, uh, we we didn't touch anything on shoots or or machine OS uh, but it it somehow triggered node replacements on all nodes it's still in investigation but I'm not. Uh, trying to focus this uh, specific example, but if if there would be any impact of upgrading Gardener, and if if there would be any impact on shoot control planes or shoot nodes, it would be really helpful for us to have those documented in Gardener releases. Hey, this this release upgrade uh, will will cause shoot nodes replacement or uh, or shoot control plane like. like should etcd restart at least that one the most important component should main etcd zero uh, so yeah this this is purely on uh, operational side what would be the impact of the customers uh, of the end users from our perspective end users are the shoot owners and so, i'm not sure how this can be addressed easily or if it can really be addressed I mean, we can take an extra A asset. Uh, we have discussed it already, right? So we, we can take an extra A on putting this information into the release notes. Uh, for the example, you mentioned that all worker notes got rolled. That actually was really in the release notes. So, um, yeah. But as I said, it's no problem that we can um, make sure that it's really inside before releasing a new version. Okay, thank you. If it's done, <laughs> it sounds <laughs> so sorry about that. <laughs> so I also try try to highlight that some when when I uh, have such a case that all the the worker notes get rolled, I, I try to make some exclamation symbol and uh, stuff. So yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure. Maybe you can also thank work you. on structuring. <laughs> that you only did your job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe you can ask Becky to test this for the next release. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm happy to test it. <laughs> okay, any other topics? Uh, I have one more. Uh, in I think in two weeks we have KubeCon, so there will be a booth uh, by SAP, so in case some Somebody is also at KubeCon. Uh, you may drop to the booth and chat, have some discussions, or have some beer. Are you sure there's some beer there? Oh, I'm sure near a conference there's always some beer, right? <laughs> <laughs>
Hopefully also at the conference. <laughs> Okay, if you don't have any other topics, then I'll close the meeting uh, and see you next time. Bye bye. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you, everyone.